first time from the side of the proposition. And let me tell you, today's world is in quite a bit of a problem. War causes more harm than, uh, than good. We believe that uh, uh, it causes more tragedy. It causes people to die. It causes states to uh, go bankrupt. It causes infrastructure to go bad. It destroys infrastructure in many states that uh, are having war. So our problem is that it worsens the life for individuals and also for the uh, for the uh, society and the state uh, and the state itself. So. Uh, but before I can explain to you why, I would like to define some of the things. Uh, some of the things. So, what is war? War is when a country declares war on another country and uh, starts military action. This uh, was accepted by the UN, uh, by all, uh, all of the members of the UN. But, uh, but uh, we believe that uh, liberation uh, uh, operations, as was the uh, insurgency operation, in Libya, to remove Gaddafi is not war because it was done by the people in, the, in, that, co in that country. So now turning to the uh, to the arguments, we will be presenting. Oh, no, thank you. Our case will be constructed out of three arguments. The first one will be uh, how the war damages infrastructure, economy, and uh, influences the pollution of uh, the, uh, in the, the the country. The second one will be about uh, enforce, uh, how enforcing regimes in another country doesn't solve doesn't solve anything. And the third one, uh, which will be represented by my second speaker, will be about a humanistic point of view on war and how it uh, influences people. So I'm turning to my first point, which is about the uh, infrastructure, economy, and pollution. So if we uh, picture ourselves a fiction scenario in which a uh, country invades another country, so what happens first? The country that is being invaded puts some barricades, they stretches, uh, barricades up cities, and, uh, makes people's life worse by uh, sending troops into cities, uh, the poor people from uh, regions uh, that are and then here and so on. No, thank you. So when this happens, people lose their homes, homes. People lose their jobs. People are not happy because of that, and we believe that this is bad as uh, itself. So, no, thank you. So uh, uh, this is just the first step. After that, the country invades uh, uh, the country. They drop the bombs. They start bombarding the cities. They uh, start sending troops there. People are dying. The cities are destroyed. Buildings that have uh, the cities that uh, are hundreds of years old are destroyed. The uh, castles, uh, galleries, museums, uh, and so on are destroyed because of those bombardments. So we believe that even in that second step, when countries uh, when countries start to fight, the situation is as bad as it gets. But in, in this world, it only gets worse as as war progresses. So, if we continue, what happens next? This, uh, uh, this tragedy is going across the whole country. Not only the borders, but uh, in the uh, capital, in the fields, and in the cities, uh, in all the cities. Because uh, the army of the invaded country gives up fight in every possible location, people are harmed in every possible location. On that point, sir. But, uh, yeah. I would like to point out that all of these harms just listed also happened during the Civil War. So yeah, but uh, so yeah, our uh, burden of proof is to prove that uh, that war causes more harm than good, and that, uh, that doesn't matter which war. Which is said that this is what happens in war, and war causes these problems. So the second, uh, no, turning to my second argument, uh, which I will be talking, how enforcing changes of regimes on other countries isn't always good. So let's take for example Afghanistan, which is current, uh, with, uh, which has been uh, uh, invaded by America to, uh, and are being forced into the democrat and into the democratic um, uh, regime. So if we take a look at what is happening you know, in Afghanistan, we think we see and we think that things are not changing as they uh, should, as the American proclaim. We believe that, that uh, people's lives are actually worse than they have been before. Uh, cities are destroyed, uh, infrastructure is destroyed, um, pollution is happening because of all these bombs and uh, ammunition and so on. Um, people's lives are changed, people are uh, running for their lives and so on. But, uh, so, if we connect this to my first argument, 
uh, even when a country tries to help another country, all of this harm is done. People are without jobs. People are without home, homes. Because of the, the because of the diversion of uh, supply trucks and so on, people are without food. Soldiers are often without food. So not only soldiers get killed in action, but also civilians, which uh, uh, which are which happen who happen to be in the area where bombs are being dropped, they also get killed. So we think that even if war is trying to help those people, it actually harms them as well. If, uh, so if you try to uh, help somebody, we think that you should go to war because you do more harm to them as uh, you, would, you would. So if we take a look at the long, long term, um, uh, because their status for granted, so people are currently, after war, are without jobs, no homes, and so on. No, thank you. The country that has been riddled with war, with casualties, with uh, destroyed infrastructure, is also uh, uh, has a very bad situation economically. So, if um, uh, if a country has been to war, they uh, gave up the all possible uh, all possible resources to bring this war. Because um, so, when they do this, they take money from other. Uh, areas that would need this money. So this is not only slowing progress in medicine, uh, 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 science, research, and so on, but it's also uh, uh, decreasing the economic stat status in this country, uh, in those countries that are in war. So um, we believe that when a country goes to war, they are not only, uh, even if they are trying to help somebody, they are not only doing harm for that country that they are waiting, but they are also doing harm to their country because the economy is being influenced. Oh, so, sir. yes, please. I would like to point out that after most major wars, including World War II, economic growth has been significantly higher. So, yeah, but if we take a look at it, so some countries had economic growth but only because they were supplying weapons uh, to uh, certain other countries. But we think that loss of human lives, uh, decrease of economic status in those countries that have been in war, that had uh, that uh, are uh, had, that had battle spots uh, in their territory, are significantly uh, uh, harmed than uh, more significantly harmed than those countries that didn't just supply weapons and so on. So. Because of all these reasons, because the uh, war doesn't only cause uh, causes uh, human loss of human lives, because it uh, it um, uh, enforces infrastructural damage, economical damage, and pollution, uh, we will be uh, back here to propose a motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hundreds of thousands of people slaughtered. Mass rape and genocide. This was the situation in Kosovo before the UN and NATO intervened. And we believe on side opposition that there are sometimes necessary circumstances where war is the only solution and by solving these problems we are outweighing anything that side opposition stands for. So, before I let like to, um, today, we are standing here to make the resolution that this house believes that war causes more problems than solves. First, I'd like to just, just have some definitional challenges on side problems and definitions. 
On side opposition, we believe that we should include foreign police action into this debate. This is a clearly militarized action, regardless of its foreign intervention, it's still the same physical appearance and emotional effects on the people. Also, from this example is Vietnam, where it's actually considered a police action still today, where clearly there's a war fought between two sides, even if the U.S. was in support. Secondly, we would just also like to clarify that civil wars are now included in today's debate as side proposition has conceded in a few months. So, before I'd like to go into side proposition case, I'd like to address side proposition case. So, pretty much the general summary of all their points is that war causes destruction, a lot of people die, and there are negative benefits. I mean, there's no real way to really go against this, as in, everyone, no one can not admit that people will die. It's a fact. People will die, and there are negative benefits, negative harms. However, on side opposition, we are here to question the justification of war. Why did these people go to war in the first place? We'd like to propose a question where, is it justified for really people to come in and intervene when there's mass human rights abuses, when there's mass genocide, when there's mass racism? Many times in history, there are historic examples which I go through. We believe on side opposition, these actually justify the war and the negative effects in these wars, and that we are actually solving a larger issue in war when it comes to preventing genocide and putting a stop to human rights abuses. Also, I'd also like to point out that side proposition has failed to give us any real world examples of today's debate on how, for instance, in World War II or something, where war causes destruction. So that might go against the credibility of their case. Now, moving on to side opposition's case. But we have more, three right? strong points for you today. The first being that war is necessary to curb human rights abuses. Secondly, that war is necessary to stop international violations. And thirdly, which my partner will go through, which is that war sets the um, stage for social reform. On our first point, on how war is necessary to curb human rights abuses. The only effective way in today's society, a lot of times, to solve problems is war, in a lot of situations. First is that, for a few reasons also. First is that war provides immediate relief for urgent causes. We see this in many examples, for instance, in the ending of a despotic regime. A, res a fall of a despot improves the basic fundamental rights of the human beings living in that country. For instance, there are, other there are a lot of reasons why these despots go up there, but the main reason that people oppose them is that they are abusing other people's rights. And this is why a lot of times the urgent need is when war is needed in that situation. Secondly, we have a situation where war creates long-term stability and local stability in the region. This is because it allows for the promotion of ideology that emphasizes protection of the people, protection of the people's rights from these oppressive regimes. Now, one of the long-term benefits of this is because it creates a precedent out there that governments should need to protect the most amount of people out there. We see many examples of this in history. For instance, in the U.S. Civil War against slavery, in this war, we created a presence and we solved the problem of the worldwide view that slavery is correct. And as any person would say that slavery is clearly morally incorrect in any time period, in any way. Secondly, in World War II, where after the collapse of Hitler and his fascist regimes, we are ending fascist empires that abuse their power, and enslave their people into ideologies that are completely false, and these only lead to more positive effects. Also, we have examples of stopping the committing of atrocious human rights abuses. We have successfully intervened in history, in particular nations, to end human rights abuses. For instance, a really renowned example is the Holocaust, where millions of Jews were gassed to death. And the only solution to this problem was the Allies had to attack. They had to intervene, and they had to commit a war. Yes? In this war, on in the Russian side, a million, uh, uh, a million, uh, a million people died. Uh, more than a million people died. So many people died even uh, when the war started. Yes, we agree. Once again, there will be deaths in war. There's obviously deaths because there is conflict. However, when people, when we are intervening in situations such as the Holocaust, we are solving more problems because we are ending mass genocide and mass abuse of human rights. We have another example of the Rwandan genocide. This is actually an example of what side proposition may support today. They're saying, okay, well, we should never go to war because people will die. Well, guess what happened in international history because of this? 
They were wanted genocide. This is when diplomacy failed, when war was not considered a solution, and hundreds of thousands of people were needlessly slaughtered. Um, so because of this, we have many impacts that come from the fact that war solves problems. Because the problem we are solving is the atrocious crime and human rights abuses that are going on. And the only way for this to happen is through war. Yes, there may be deaths, but we believe that the consequence of solving the problem with human rights abuses outweighs any kind of death that is inherent in war or any kind of economic pollution that science problems would like for you to believe today. Now, moving on to our second point, which is that war stops um, the international rights violations. We have a few sub points on this. First is the principal right of self defense. Now, there's a contract between the government and the people, which is that if the people really obey the laws, pay their taxes, and really do their dues, the government has the fundamental need to protect them. Now, this is best demonstrated in times of war. When an invading country comes into a country, is side proposition really going to tell this country to say, oh, no, we can't commit war right now because it's going to cause death. You should just stay here. This is completely wrong. A lot of times, war is justified because it is an act of self-defense. For example, in Korea, North Korea invaded South Korea and almost wiped the entire country out of its population. This is when the UN decided to come in and intervene and save hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of lives. The same example could come to place in World War II, where Allies also intervened in response to Germany invasion of Poland. Now, we also see this in another subpoint on sovereignty, where war is one of the only ways for countries to preserve their own sovereignty. This is seen because the only way to assert national identity, obviously, is not to be crushed by other oppression, oppressive regimes. It would prevent ethnic abuse and also the need of civil war in this case in order to abuse power. So, what we have proven today is that on this point, war provides the basic human rights. And because of this, it is a problem of life and death. This is what war is solving for the problem of life and death. It solves the fact that this is that death is not necessary in case of genocide and that there should be a presence that the war is necessary to come in that any kind of human rights benefits we get outweighs any kind of death side opposition today. So for these reasons I urge a strong vote for the opposition. Oh, 
life for our brothers and husbands and everyone else in our lives. So, as I said, after this, 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 uh, this uh, person has probably there is on the message your husband, your brother is dead. And what comes then? Like, that, that comes nothing else but revenge. There comes through a pure straight uh, anger and this anger, as you know, this is not a good feeling. It causes even more problems. It causes revenge that leads us to, to another war, another violence, and this is how things should not be fought. Because as we see, in this consequence that we feel for, feel for losing our dear ones, we just see even more reasons that we should, or even, we, we feel that even this small problem that seems insignificant before, there are some things now that we should fight, we should struggle, we should kill them all, and this is bad. Why? Because war causes more bad emotions than war before, that would need to be there, because as I said, we believe we all the time, we, all, we, we believe all the time that there is still the there still are things that we could have done before we go to war. And this is what we believe and we understand for. We believe that talking even for 30 years is better, it's got us less, less problems than going to war and kill everyone else. And for example, for 10 years, make things better. We believe that, um, that as I said, violence isn't fault with violence, it should never be. We believe that it's better than bad for a while than just being afraid for your life and for the life of the all others. So this is why I beg for all the questions. Thank you very much. You're fearful because you live in an oppressive regime. What of many? in the world. You're sad because one of your relatives has been taken to jail because they were a political dissident. You're going to press because you realize that there's nothing you can do to get it back. And you go crazy because there's absolutely nothing you can do against such a despotic regime. And so when you realize that war is the only way to solve this problem, side opposition presents you with the fact that war solves more problems than it creates. And so I will Prove it by first examining the proposition case before moving on and extending the opposition case. So let's begin with the proposition case. Their first argument that war destroys the infrastructure, war uh, ruins the economy, a war causes pollution. Um, first, the infrastructure, war damages the infrastructure, but uh, infrastructure can always be replaced. You see, the economic results of war, as I will be showing, as I will show in my third piece, actually mean more growth, more reconstruction after the war. In fact, you see Japan, which was uh, infrastructure completely ruined after World War II, rose to become the second largest economy in the world for a span of decades. Now it may be taken over by China, but that doesn't uh, overshadow the fact that its war reconstruction was amazing and it helped raise the life of the Japanese people uh, beyond what could be imagined yet. Yeah. Yes, Japan is an individual case because their bullies that attacked them, that oppressed them for six years 
took a lot of money back into them because they felt bad and that Yeah, but uh, the point in general here is that infrastructure can be rebuilt and the economy in fact will flourish. Now for the economy, again, I will address my third argument, the economy in fact flourishes up the war and about pollution, well in fact pollution actually occurs more during regular uh, time without conflict. You have, you know, CO2, you have factories and so, I mean, all, all of this is irrelevant when you consider the fact that war is justified and in fact solves more problems than it creates. Now going on to the second uh, point, that enforcing regimes in other countries don't work. Well, we agree because uh, in most cases, side opposition realizes that people going to war are going for just causes. They're not going uh, to invade. In fact, the reason you know the Allies went to war in World War II is not to you know change, uh, change the government of Germany, but rather to respond to the fact that they were killing you know, not only Jews but also you know the Slavs, the Polish, the homosexuals, and that this was just such a great Gross human rights violation that something had to be done and this was the only option. Now the third argument, the humanistic on, uh, view on war, again, you, uh, you must realize that war yes, uh, creates many feelings inside, but so does being oppressed, so does being a victim of human rights abuses, so does being a victim of rape as a result of the fact that a uh, government sponsors the group, so does the fact that a government is oppressing you and as you must realize war is the only way to get out of these kinds of desperate situations. So uh, now they also state that violence shouldn't be used against violence. But Sark's proposition provides absolutely no other alternative to stop Hitler historically or to, you know, prevent uh, or, or to stop the violence. I mean, in Rwanda, like, if we, we didn't go to war and look what happened, we took action too late. Now, if you imagine a world with no war under their definition, any country can attack right. another country, but the other country can't respond because responding would be war. So now you're having all these countries attacking each other, but the victim can't respond because that would be war. And if you can't respond, then you know what happens to self-defense, what happens to sovereignty, what happens to society. I mean, if you think about their definition and what they're proposing, aka no war, then you realize that this creates so much more problems than assault when a country can't even respond to defend itself. So now I would like to move on to the opposition case. Going back again to the first argument, that war is necessary to curb human rights abuses. You see, yes, war does create a lot of problems, but one, these problems exist without war, and two, war solves even greater problems that would have existed continue without war. You know, if Serbia was allowed to just continue to massacre many of the Europeans that they didn't like. You know, if Hitler was just allowed to continue to expand his German empire, to kill as many people as he wanted, because simply because, you know, war is a bad thing and we shouldn't go to war, then, you know, what about all these human rights abuses? What about all these people that are dying? In fact, we go to war to stop all these problems that these crazy people have decided to inflict on the world. Yes. Nazis cause those problems by going to war. Allies just defend them, them, themselves from them. No, you see, the, the German invasion of Poland was absolutely sad because Poland couldn't even respond. You see, Allies had to go in and defend the Polish. But that is besides the point because you see here, the general idea is that war is only resorted to as a last resort when you have these huge problems that impact millions of people and that cannot be solved through diplomacy, cannot be solved by patting Hitler's hand and saying, would you please stop because guess what, most people aren't going to listen to that. So you see, war is necessary and when these large problems are solved, when the third right is removed, then it is clear that war uh, solves more problems than it creates. I mean, not only to see Germany's reconstruction, not only to see lives improving after the war, but the most important thing is that these lives are being saved and this war is being, uh, this violence is being stopped and that, that alone justifies and shows that war solves more problems than it creates. And so even though the side proposition may say, you know, war causes environmental damage, war does some damage to the land, etc., but you must realize that these problems are insignificant and so small compared to the fact when you have such an oppressive and crazy regime. So now, let's move on to the second point, is provided to you by side opposition. You see that war is necessary to curb international violations. Under international law, it is a violation for any country to just drive things into another country crossing the border. And yet side opposition today says, no, we, we, 
War causes more problems than that to solve. Uh, so we must not go to war if you believe what they are claiming. And so under their situation, under their case that they are promoting, the, a victim country would never be able to defend itself. So what about sovereignty? What about self-defense? Under their logic, South Korea would just say, oh, war is bad. We can't defend ourselves. So, you know, we'll just let North Korea take over. That is simply unacceptable to side opposition. And now finally, the third argument, that war fosters economic development. Now, it is an economic simulator when you see that West Germany, post-World War II, industrial production doubled over seven years. Not only that, GDP grew at 9 to 10 percent annually. And France after World War II, now they think that you know, uh, people, uh, only the people supplying the arms had growing money. But France was occupied and was part of the war. After the war, their GDP grew at 5 percent annually, something you know, Mr. Holland would probably be very glad to see currently. Um, and not only that, but it was because of the increased productivity and the prolonged working hours as a result of the war that resulted in such economic boom and this only increased the French quality of life. And that, as a result, it also prompts innovation because technological development during wartime benefit people uh, often follow military necessity and, um, and you also benefit health. And so when you see that war is not only a necessity but it also solves the greatest problems in facing our world, Dear Mr. Speaker, a very famous scientist was once asked how will the war, uh, how will the third world war, world war occur? He said, I do not know, but I certainly do know how the fourth world war will occur. It will be fought with sticks and stones, and that tells us a lot about the current situation in the world. We believe that the historical examples that they have used are completely irrelevant to this case because after the ending of the Second World War, several initiatives can be started all around the world to prevent war at, uh, at entirely. NATO, the UN, the Warsaw Pact were all results of fear before war. And we believe that the fear of war is a much stronger weapon than war itself because fear can stop the invasion of North Korea to South Korea because they know they'll get eliminated if they even try that. Fear prevents the government from invading no country, from invading uh, neighboring countries because they know they will get burned to the ground if they even touch anyone else because we have a global police. And by their logic of solving problems, we should probably just bomb the entire world with nuclear weapons to solve every minor problem that arises, every human rights oppression, but we say there are different mechanisms that are better in solving these problems. So, uh, I just want to clarify, the opposition here today is doing a magical thing. They want us to prove something that is not included in the motion, and that is that war is unjust. Uh, well, okay, I'll do that because if I don't, then I wouldn't have any reputation, and I will also prove what uh, uh, the problems are actually much bigger for side proposition than solving problems on side proposition. So, firstly, I would like to mention the hasty generalization that did with Kosovo and Serbia. That's an isolated problem. So, uh, the, the, the current status of Yugoslavia back right then was very different from the entire world. Uh, we know that because we secluded from them and they wanted to do the same for us, but other countries jumped in and saved us with diplomacy. We had a nine-day war and we stopped it just because we knew that many people would get killed. 
in, uh, in Kosovo was ignored by the global community, but the global community is getting better every day. Information is spreading faster, and the uh, massacre that happened in Srebrenica could have been stopped if information was faster uh, before it even occurred. Um, uh, so the opposition comes on and says that the war is justified when human rights are abused. Yes, so we should probably just invade all, the whole of Africa because every country abuses their human rights. No, we say no, we must do this with diplomacy and let the countries evolve on their own to have their sovereignty. On that point, uh, peace. Don't you think this sounds exactly what the UN logic was in Rwanda? Oh, well, the logic of the UN changes constantly because they know they made a mistake back there. So, uh, next storm. They say that wars protect the rights. No, between the time of war there are no rights. People kill each other just to survive. The state of anarchism comes when war starts. And we believe that anarchism is bad, and that's why we have society as an entity at all. Uh, next up, they justify the Holocaust intervention by saying we stop the killing of Jews. Well, we say that this would be prevented if the Allies were ignorant and had a global community that protected the small like we have today. So we believe that that example is uh, irrelevant. Uh, uh, another one. No, thank you. So, uh, and also on that point, 20 million Russians were killed to liberate the remaining Jews that were stated in Germany. And we believe that that is hardly a justification at all, and that things like this should not happen in the modern world, which is talked about in this motion, and not historical examples from another time, when we had, uh, when, when, when there were no protected entities on this world to protect the small, protect the weak. But now we have them because we evolve over time in the society. And after uh -huh. time, no thank you, we will eliminate all, for, uh, all need for war on the entire planet, and we are on a good way to that. Next up, they say that war stops international law violation. Yes, a war stops it, but we have a much more efficient method. We have a global hegemon, which is the United Nations. And even though it has been proved that it is ineffective at some times, NATO can always jump in, other, uh, other unions of countries can always, jump, uh, can always jump in, because no one wants war, because everyone knows how, uh, what a terrible experience war actually is. On that point, no thank you, that people lose faith in humanity because of war, and not because of diplomatic actions which we think are the future of this planet. So, uh, continuing, we believe that any example, uh, as I stated before, we believe that any example before World War II should be ignored in the judging and at all in the debate. Because it's no thank you because it's irrelevant, because we are entities that protect the small now. And we believe that a source of fear is a be way better source of peace than after war times, which, which are always tough. And like they say, a war brings economic development. Why can't we just have uh, economic development without war? Why can't, can't we just invest into small countries? We believe that that's a problem that can be solved, and we don't need to kill a certain percentage of their population to get the money to start a better economy. So we believe that that example is completely ridiculous. On that point, no, thank you. A uh, bomb in Japan in times uh, in exchange for economic growth seems very ridiculous to me as a point, and very horrible to say the least because they could have just invested into the smaller country and the conflict would have never began because the whole nature of the World War II conflict was that people were oppressed and no one acted as was with the German people in France and as was with Japan was uh, oppressed by Russia at that time. So, uh, I would now like in my last minute to re-establish our case. Firstly, we believe that the uh, war causes three main problems. The devastation, uh, it enforces regimes that the people may not want, and thirdly, the effects on the individual, which is the problem and many other feelings that are inherently bad for the person, because we, uh, in that, you know, a person in that state can't think, can't evolve, and will only regress to a previous state, or he will kill themselves, and we believe that that is very, very bad. So, uh, just, a, uh, just a quick uh, uh, reflection before we finish. 
Um, devastation of war brings uh, problems on three levels. Infrastructure it takes a long time to rebuild, and we don't, we don't see the need to destroy it in the first place. Secondly, the economy, which also rebuilds over time, and uh, thirdly, the pollution, which never rebuilds. We are killing our planet with every war more than we are killing it now in uh, with industry. We are killing it with every atom bomb we drop. Um, next up, uh, war enforces new regimes. The U.S. has a clear policy of enforcing democracy everywhere it wages war, and people don't like that in their own countries. And lastly, people feel sad, people feel depressed. And all, that, uh, all those three main problems and everything else, we beg you to propose the motion, because we have shown you that the other side has, uh, has been giving you false, uh, false examples and false causes. Thank you. First, 
They have not shown how this will actually work in the real world, and they have not given some policy on how we will have these kinds of negotiations or alternatives to war. And so because we have to stop this, like, the loss of lives, you have to look at the opposition, because we give examples of self-defense, we give examples of civil war, and stopping the Holocaust. Now, on the U.S. Civil War, we fought for, for stopping slavery. America, uh, Americans were divided over slavery. But we were protecting people worldwide, world, worldwide from bigotry and from death. Slaves jumped overboard from their ships. Hundreds of millions of people were used and then killed. And so you cannot allow this abuse to proliferate. We cannot stand for this kind of thing in this round and as people of, the, of a global community. And so what you must look at in this round and on the effects of war is that side opposition is going to be a way to, to check oppressive regimes, a way to throw off colonization, and ultimately to promote civil wars of liberation and wars of self-defense. All that we heard from the proposition and answers is, this, is and I quote, a bad life is better than no life. Where well, is a bad life really as good as being raped, as torture, as all these terrible abuses? No, it is not. And so a bad life is not better than a good life. We need to save these lives. So, uh, no, thank you, guys. We have institutions that solve this problem. Oh, okay. We hear about these institutions first, not specifically, and in a POI in a third speech. Uh, in this regard, POI. Okay, now let's look at the example of the Holocaust. Hitler and his regime, and his regime were targeting ethnic groups, were targeting uh, certain groups who had uh, their own beliefs, different beliefs. And so they killed millions of these people. Yes, maybe some, uh, it was tried that some Russian forces, uh, one million according to the first speech, uh, died in this uh, war. However, we saved 6 million, 11 million lives through stopping the Holocaust. And we put a check on this abuse. What would the proposition have the world do? Sit back and watch more people get killed? The number would went from 11 people killed in the Holocaust to 20 million. To increasing and increasing. And so what the proposition is advocating for is inaction, and that is not a solution for our world. They have not given us any other way to stop these abuses. They say institutions. But how is that this kind of vague answer is not enough, is not sufficient enough to stop these abuses, and we do not buy that. We can't gamble this, uh, these people's lives on institutions. Now, also, the point is like, okay, they say that all of our examples are isolated. We've given you many examples. For example, uh, Rwanda, Vietnam, Korea, Afghanistan, Iraq, the Gulf War, etc. The list goes on and on. And so, how are all of these examples isolated? And so, we clearly outweigh them on evidence. On the war, uh, on the issue of war. Also, they said that the fear of war is an efficient deterrent, and we do not need the fear of we do not need wars to stop the human rights abuses. And they said we have to look at after 1945. So, first of all, this is extremely ridiculous because you can't limit war to just a 50 years in the past. We have to look at war throughout history. Second of all. If you want to look at after 1945, again, the Gulf War, Afghanistan, Iraq, Vietnam, Korea, Rwanda, the fear of war is not stopping any of these mass deaths, any of these oppressive regimes. And so, then, even under their limitations, the fear of war is not an effective term. They say that people will go crazy under a war. They say that sadness and fear and anger and revenge, these feelings will come up. However, what's worse? Being killed with no intervention, nobody standing up for you, and no way to stop the genocide, these human rights abuses will go in check, keep furthering these feelings. That means this whole argument about human, human, uh, the human side of the war is completely based on a fictional situation about her husband or her brother. And so, if they could give me a study, if they could give me any type of evidence about these negative benefits of war, then maybe this would be a legitimate argument, but it clearly is not. And finally, we will look at the economy, infrastructure, and environmental war. First, on economy and infrastructure, this is a minor point, and, it far, uh, and our arguments far outweigh their economy and infrastructure point because what is more important? Having a perfect city, having nice infrastructure, or having people that can actually live in the city and are not dead, are not being killed by ethnic cleansing. And so, the infrastructure point is far outweigh, but infrastructure and, the, uh, and war has actually boosted infrastructure. For example, Japan. Um, it actually, after the in the aftermath of war, in the aftermath of uh, the U.S. putting in a government, which answers the second argument, in Japan, economic productivity increased, and now they're a major superpower in our world. And so their economic argument falls. 
And also, during, uh, in terms of the environment, during government brutality or genocide, there's no concern for the environment. But by uh, having more deliberation, you institute people who can take care of the environment. So let's compare worlds. First, on the proposition, you have inaction, a dystopia comes to life, and no self-defense for people who need it. But on the opposition, we stop death, we stop genocide, and we solve the pressing issues of our world today. Thank you. Believe that war creates more problems than it solves, even though it doesn't. 
So now let's examine the real life implications of all of these wars. So on side off the China shows how war, wars will solve oppression. Now this is the only way, and in fact has shown through all of civil liberation wars, you know, from whatever time frame they choose. I'm sure the people in Bangladesh were happy they had their war so they could be free from the oppressive hands of the You know, all of these things. And side off of them shows you they saw we saw human rights abuses and all of the problems facing humanity today. While side opposition will only continue all of these problems indefinitely. Therefore, side opposition is proud so far. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to welcome you from the side of the position one that fight. So, I would like to begin my speech off by saying that today's opposition does not realize that the motion states that war causes more harm than good. They think that the motion says that the war, uh, that, uh, that, we, that our burden is to uh, to uh, to uh, uh, to uh, show you that uh, to show you complete perfection. But we think that if we show you that there is more harm done by war than there is good done, then we want this display. And I will tell you why we did this. In did it, did it in three points. The first point will be about how war solves problems. Uh, I will be uh, commenting their uh, statement that war solves problems caused by war. And second point, I will be talking about if, uh, if uh, we really solve Holocaust with burning Nazis. And the first point, I will be talking uh, about other means of dealing with these problems. So let me start off in the first point. So does war really uh, is war really solvable by war? What the day's opposition has uh, shown us their examples, uh, example of, uh, North, uh, of Korea, of, uh, of Kosovo, and so on. So let me begin with their example of uh, Korea. So what they said uh, is that war caused many problems there. There were uh, massacres, there were rapes, and so on. So yeah, thank you for showing us that war is bad. So yeah, what it did then, they said that uh, war, uh, that they started a war with them so they can, uh, so uh, they could solve problems caused by war. So we think this is a logical fa a fallacy logic uh, so because they say that they can uh, fight far, fight far and do a better job and do uh, more uh, good than harm. So what this proposition believes is that uh, we cannot, uh, we cannot really uh, solve all of the problems in the world uh, by war. We uh, we believe that if we go to war, the cause of uh, problems caused by war, we are causing more and more and more of those problems, and this is an infinite loop in which we uh, lost control, lose control of uh, uh, lose control of uh, things. And as my first speaker explained, in war there is anarchy and there is bad, uh, bad situation for the people. In war, there, uh, not only are the few hospitals filled with dead people and uh, hurt, hurt people, but also the mental hospitals, which are uh, full of people who uh, had a mental breakdown because of all of the uh, things they saw. So, yeah, the next proposition has told us that war uh, sometimes solves. Uh, some problems uh, like uh, dictatorships and uh, uh, aggressive regimes, but we think that this can still be done by other means than going there and killing everybody that is being oppressed. So, going to my second point, I mean, really, so many Holocaust with burning Nazis. So, if we take uh, uh, a standpoint for, uh, to look at this, so in World War II, there were 6 million of Jews who were killed. 
and in the war against Marcus to, uh, to save those uh, Jews, um, 20 million Russian Russian died. So our question is: uh, uh, Is uh, 20 million lives really more important uh, than six? Uh, is those six million lives really more important than 20 million? We think that, that by that, markets are more harm than good. So I'm bringing my third, uh, third and last point of the debate is the uh, other means of dealing with these problems. What I heard speaker said is that uh, this hasn't come up until the POI, my first and third speaker, but he uh, has been going on and on about it in his first speech. He said that because, of the, uh, uh, because there are such large institutions as the UN and NATO, a fear of war uh, is actually solving more problems than uh, uh, war itself. So because of all of these reasons, we beg you to propose the motion. Thank you.